Okay, good morning, Heritage. Good morning. <clears throat> My name's Michael. Um, today, singing with us, there will be playing the viola, Johanna, Johanna, Johanna. Um, playing the violin, Olivia, singing with me is Hilly, Lily, and Bella. My name's Michael. Um, so just, you know, on the piano, we do have the amazing Amari. And um, just so that you guys know, there will be training at lunchtime for the camera work. So just meet in here during lunch if you're doing that. Okay, so our first and opening song will be number 569, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Next song will be number 341. Okay. 341. To God be the glory.
song will be number 432 shall we gather at the river please stand
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for allowing us to gather here and have this worship this morning. Please help it to be um, beneficial and, you know, for us to really soak in everything that we hear today. In the name of Jesus, amen. So yesterday, we talked about William Miller, and we followed William Miller all the way up to 1839, and of course in 1839, William Miller expected the second coming to come in 1843, which would be yet four years. By 1839, he had developed a bit of a following. He had about a hundred pastors who also espoused his beliefs and preached the same message. He had done limited publishing. He had some articles published in a newspaper and he had, a, uh, had them published in a book as well. And then in 1839, he met Joshua Himes and Joshua Himes had a larger view of the work to be done. And I, I think it's fair to say that the same way William Miller had kind of a contracted view of what he needed to do, in other words, he spoke to small congregations like this size or smaller. He could be speaking to a group of 20 people in a living room. Um, he had, he had kind of a smaller view of taking the message to the world. Joshua Himes had a larger view. I would say it's fair to say that we have kind of a contracted view of taking the message to the world in that we don't feel a personal burden to do it. And maybe it's not a burning conviction that drives our lives every day. But for these men, this belief was a fire in their heart, and it drove them. So let me start with Joshua Himes' story. Joshua was born in Wickford, Rhode Island. His parents intended him to become an Episcopal priest, but um, they had a business deal that went bad, and when the business deal went bad, they lost a lot of money, so they couldn't afford to put him in college. And so instead of going to college, he became an apprentice of a cabinet maker in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, the picture there is an old picture of New Bedford, Massachusetts. You can see all the sailing ships there. That's why they have all those masts. Um, at 18, he joined uh, the Christian Connection Church in New Bedford, where he was licensed as an exhorter. And in November 1825, he married Mary Thompson Handy. And the following year, he was ordained to the ministry. Over the next few years, he pastored several districts in Massachusetts before becoming the pastor of the first Christian church in Boston in 1830. That's a picture of that church, uh, a more modern edition of it. There he rose to prominence, reviving a church that was near death and becoming active in the educational, temperance, peace, and abolitionist reform movements of the day. Remember, I told you yesterday that during this time there was a whole, a large group of people who believed that Jesus would come following the millennium that, and that what we had to do was fix all the problems in, in society, get people reformed, and then after that, you know, you would have this thousand years of peace, and then after that, Jesus would come. And so there are many movements like that, um, an education movement, a temperance movement. Um, let me explain the temperance movement. There was... Um, I guess you would think these are strange beliefs, but people didn't really think that water was good for you back then. So they didn't drink a lot of it. They avoided it most of their life. Didn't take baths. Um, and, you know, if you were born in 1800, it's likely you would be dead by the time 
1830 came around because life expectancy was short because they had no idea about what, what caused health or what caused disease. So instead of drinking water, they drank alcohol so, um, and a lot of it because, um, well, you know, germs don't grow in alcohol. Of course, they didn't know germ theory because this is before Louis Pasteur. So um, there was a lot of drunkenness. And along with drunkenness comes men who come home drunk and beat up their wives and their kids. So the temperance movement was a big reform from that time to, to end all this alcoholism. So he was part of that. Uh, an abolitionist, reform, anti-slavery. So, Himes was in every sense a reformer, espousing all these causes. And um, in that church, a lot of people found all these things a little troubling because they were more of a conservative church. And so the church kind of split. And so he took a good group out of that church and he started a new church on Chardon Street in Boston. And that church was built to hold 500 people. And that's a picture of it on the right. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, America's famous poet and writer, wrote after a November 1840 meeting um, at that church. Um, he's, he, th these are his words. If the assembly was disorderly, it was picturesque. Madmen, mad women, men with beards, drunkards, Muggle, Muggletonians, uh, come-outers, groaners, agrarians, Seventh-day Baptists, Quakers, abolitionists, Calvinists, Unitarians, and philosophers all came successively to the top and seized their moment, if not their hour, wherein to chide, pray, or preach or protest. So he had this huge group from all different um, beliefs that came to hear him and be part of his movement. Himes met William Miller in 1839 in Exeter, New Hampshire, and he was impressed with Miller's um, message, and so he asked Miller to come to the Chardon Street Chapel to, sp to speak. On the left, that's a, an original copy of one of um, Joshua Himes' pamphlets that he published for William Miller. From these lectures, Himes became convinced of the soon return of Christ and sought opportunities for Miller to preach. Now, there was an interesting conversation between Miller and Himes. Himes, <laughs> Himes invited him over to his house. Sitting at the table, he looked Mr. Miller intently in the eye and said, Mr. Miller, do you believe in the things that you preach? <laughs> and of course, you know, William Miller affirmed that he did. And so then Himes asked him, then why are you preaching to these teeny tiny congregations? Why are you not preaching in big cities like Boston, New York, Washington, DC? And Miller's response was, well, I only go where the Lord invites me. So Himes says, so then if you're invited, you will go? And he said, yes, I will. So Himes' response is, very well, you will be invited to speak in all these cities. And Himes went out and immediately arranged for a huge speaking tour for William Miller. So Himes really changed William's, William Miller's life, his message, and the quantity of his work. Himes was a powerful preacher, a man of deep spirituality and perfect integrity. His personality was attractive, and he had a gift for popular, appealing presentation of his message. His ability in the pulpit was outshone only by his unusual gifts as an editor and an organizer. That's one of his uh, publications right there, The Midnight Cry on the left. Soon, some of the best publishing facilities in the country were enlisted for the publication of numerous papers, tracts, books, pamphlets, songbooks, charts, broadsides, that's a, a great big um, paper, and handbills issued under his direction. When an evangelistic series was conducted in New York City, Himes started a daily newspaper, The Midnight Cry, 
to publicize the Advent teachings. For a time, 10,000 copies a day were sold or given away on the street. That's way more than what Mr. Miller was doing. In addition to speaking engagements, Himes got the Adventist message in print. Um, less than three months after joining with Miller, Himes went to Dow and Jackson, who were anti-slavery publishers, to print his first editions of Signs of the Times. There's some more of the papers that he printed, The Midnight Cry, The Voice of Truth, Trumpet of Alarm, The Western Midnight Cry, The Second Coming of Christ, and The Voice of Elijah in all those different cities. These publications were well circulated, and in May 1844, Himes was able to say that the combined total of papers and tracts published exceeded five million copies. Are you hearing those numbers? That's more than speaking to a congregation of like 50 or so. This is really moving a message. This is significant since the US Census in 1840, the country's population was 17 million. So he was, all, he was affecting a large portion of America. Himes not only arranged Miller's revivals, but he edited his journals. As 1843 neared, Miller spoke more than 300 times in six months on this message, are you ready to meet your savior? He also published that familiar um, Millerite chart. He also had a tent built in uh, 1843, Rochester, New York. They had uh, their series of camp meetings there and then a whole series of camp meetings all over the Northeast, about 130 of them starting in 1842 and over 500,000 people had attended those camp meetings. So that means one in 34 Americans had been to one of his camp meetings. That's a picture of one of those camp meetings. This is a picture of Himes as he's older. Now, there was the great disappointment in 1844. Jesus didn't come, and this is what Himes felt about it, that they were... Um, they were not in error as to the event, they were in error as to the time, and he, realized, he reasoned that their calculations were wrong, they couldn't base the calculations correctly on the, on the dates that they had, but he thought that the second coming was still near. So he ended up leading a group, after the great disappointment, there were three groups of Adventists, one was a spiritualizer group, Another was led by Joshua Himes, and the other group became the Sabbatarian Adventists that became Seventh-day Adventists. So he said, although we are near the end, we have no knowledge of a fixed date or a definite time, but do fully believe that we should watch and wait for the coming of Christ as an event that may take place any hour. Under Himes' leadership, the group took steps to organize itself into a distinct Adventist body in Albany, New York. This is the tombstone that marks his grave. Um, it says on it, uh, who shall roll away the stone from Mark 16, verse 3. And that's a close-up of the tombstone. So a very remarkable man with a very remarkable life, a very unremarkable grave. Let's, um, close, let's close our eyes, bow our heads for a closing word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace, for the power that you moved upon the hearts of William Miller, Joshua Himes, and the Millerites in general. And pray that you would awaken a similar revival amongst us, move among our hearts. Lord, give us conviction of the nearness of the second coming. Awaken us to the reality that is all about us. Help us to know Jesus down to the core of our being, and rightly represent him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I've been asked to make an announcement. If there's any of you that would like to work with the cameras or the, uh, the video, the sound, um, please see there's going to be a sign-up sheet at the back, and there will be a meeting today uh, immediately. This is after lunch, immediately after lunch here 
in this uh, auditorium. So if that's something you would like to do, 